Hello, everyone, and welcome to Akoya Biosciences webinar series. Today's presentation, Validating Multiplexed Antibody Panels for Pancreatic Research Applications, is presented by Dr. Diane Saunders and Dr. Grady Carlson. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Akoya Biosciences. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit akoyabio.com. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or you can use that ask a question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Speaking first today, we have Dr. Grady Carlson. Technical Application Scientist, Akoya Biosciences. Following Dr. Carlson, we have Dr. Diane Saunders, Staff Scientist, Powers and Brasova Research Group, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. For complete biographies on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of the screen. Dr. Carlson, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Grady Carlson, and I am a Technical Application Scientist for Akoya Biosciences. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Codex solution, which allows for highly multiplex tissue profiling for single-cell spatial analysis. The need for multi-marker spatial analysis arises from a multitude of publications that have demonstrated that not only the composition of a tissue but also the localization of the cells that comprise that tissue is significant for understanding biological outcomes. For example, in a 2017 paper by Bernie Fox's lab, they demonstrated that in oral squamous cell carcinoma, the sheer number and composition of the tissue in terms of the FOXP3T regulatory cells did not stratify patient populations. But when they looked at the spatial proximity of those T regulatory cells, relative to the CD8T killer cells, the patient population was stratified. This is just one example of how we need to be able to understand how, spell, how cells are spatially related in the tissue. Now, Akoya has two platforms for multi-marker spatial, spatial analysis. There is the Phenoptic portfolio, which allows for high throughput tissue multiplexing via opal staining and multispectral unmixing. And then there is CODEX, which is co-detection by indexing, which is a high parameter modality for multi-marker spatial analysis. And this allows for the detection of a high number of markers on cells with single cell resolution. And we'll be talking about CODEX today. So the basic chemistry underlying antigen detection using CODEX is this. We have primary antibodies that are DNA barcoded. And these primary antibodies are going to bind their target antigens inside of the tissue. We're going to reveal where these primary antibodies have bound to their target antigens using DNA barcodes that are bound to fluorophores. We call these CODEX reporters. So these CODEX reporters have the reverse DNA barcode as the DNA barcode conjugated to the antibody. And this is how we're going to be able to visualize where these antibodies have bound their target antigens inside of tissue. The workflow for CODEX is to first stain the tissue with a cocktail of DNA barcoded primary antibodies shown here. These antibodies are going to be fixed to the tissue so that they are not removed in the following processes. We're going to reveal where these antibodies have bound their target antigen using a one-step reveal process in each codex cycle. 
Now this is an isothermal process by which the codex reporters are hybridized to the DNA barcoded antibodies. This automation for revealing where these antibodies are inside of tissue is provided by codex. And so we're going to reveal, image, and then remove our codex reporters. This codex cycle then can be repeated in a second codex cycle in a third so that we can collect all of our target markers in as many cycles as we need. So here I'm showing that in each codex cycle we're collecting uh, three targets as well as DAPI so that we can image all of our target biomarkers uh, using codex for a total of uh, over 40 markers. So codex has three components. There's the codex reagents, there's the fluidics control, which automates both the fluidics and the imaging automation, and the codex software. So the codex reagents are a flexible system. We have the ability to use uh, validated antibodies provided by Acoya, and we also have custom reagents for you. So you can conjugate uh, DNA barcodes to your own antibodies if that's something that you would like to do. Speaking to that end, there are three types of codex antibodies. We have codex inventoried antibodies, and these are validated and sold as a complete assay. We have codex screened antibodies, which are tested for barcode and reporter compatibility. And these are not sold by Acoya, but they are user conjugated. And then we have codex community antibodies, which are tested and shared by codex users, and they're not tested or sold by Acoya. And again, the user conjugation is required. So here's an example of codex compatible antibodies for human fresh frozen, mouse fresh frozen, and human FFP, it's PE tissue. So codex is compatible with both fresh frozen and FFPE tissue, and the markers it's compatible with at this point are shown here, and we're always building in more markers to be compatible with codex. So Codex also allows uh, control of the fluidics for full automation of the system. Here we're seeing the integration of the Codex insert with an, inserted, with an inverted microscope. And so what we're able to do is place this Codex insert on the microscope stage. And then we have our tissue placed on a cover slip which fits within that Codex insert that sits on the stage so that we're able to complete the entire imaging and revealing process with the tissue on the microscope stage. This allows for full automation of the process. So just as a summary, we're going to section our tissue onto a cover slip. We're then going to incubate our tissue with a cocktail of DNA barcoded primary antibodies. This tissue is then going to be inserted into the codex insert which sits on the microscope stage and the full integration of codex with the microscope can be seen here we're then going to use codex to automate both the fluidics and the imaging processes to acquire three markers in every codex cycle so here we can see codex automation used for stitching all of our uh, images together for a complete 41 marker uh, image of a one centimeter squared human tonsil tissue. And of course, in this particular image, we're only showing uh, six markers because visualizing 41 at the same time would be rather challenging. In addition to controlling uh, the automation, Codex is also able to uh, analyze the images once they've been uh, captured. So we have three components to the software. There is the Codex Instrument Manager, which is going to be responsible for controlling the fluidics as well as the microscope. There is the Codex Analysis Manager, which is going to be responsible for data processing, including formatting the data and allowing for cell segmentation and clustering. And then there's the multiplex analysis viewer, which is going to allow us to interpret our data and perform the analysis. The data that are produced by 
codex uh, come in some simple formats. The cells are segmented, and these segmented cells in the image produce an FCS file, and we also have TIFF images. Now, also in this FCS file, we have um, cytometric data for each cell that's segmented, as well as that cell's XY coordinates. And this is what allows us to do spatial analysis on the cells in our image because we have both sedimetric data to determine the phenotype and then spatial analysis to determine uh, the spatial location of that cell inside of tissue. We can create populations and identify populations of cells using a couple different strategies. One of those strategies is to use a, a flow gating strategy shown here where we can identify populations in the tissue uh, while we gate them. The other strategy is to perform clustering where we cluster the data and then identify cells or populations uh, using those clusters. Once we've created our populations, we can then map them in the tissue uh, using the Voronoi plot shown here. And we can see that with over 40 markers available to us, in this case, we're using uh, 20 plus cellular phenotypes. I believe this particular uh, tissue was seen with 29 markers in a uh, tertiary lymphoid follicle of breast cancer, we can see that uh, they, we have complex phenotypes in a number of them. We can have a number of them because of the multitude of markers available to us. And the Voronoi plot shown here is actually constructed based on the cell's nearest neighbors. And it's this construction of the Voronoi plot that allows us to evaluate which cells are highly interacting or uh, weakly interacting. Those interactions, whether it's more interacting or less interacting, can be calculated and visualized in this log odds ratio shown here in this interaction matrix. So cells shown in red, or if they share a red square, that means that they're highly interacting and the probability of seeing them interacting in this image is high. Whereas if they're shown in uh, blue, that means that they're weakly interacting or they're less interacting. The, probably, the probability of seeing uh, those two cells together in the image is low. So in conclusion, uh, the codex system enables highly multiplex immunofluorescence for over 40 markers imaging across the whole tissue or in selected regions of interest. It allows for conversion of existing uh, fluorescence microscope into high dimensional cell analysis tool. It's compatible with FFPE and fresh frozen samples and we're soon coming out with cell spread compatibility. It does not degrade the tissue, and it's compact and affordable. And now I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Saunders. Thanks, Dr. Carlson, um, and thanks to Akoya for the invitation to speak today. Um, I work in a research lab within the Vanderbilt Diabetes Center, and I'll be sharing some of our initial studies with the codex system. To give you a quick preview, I'll first introduce some of the experimental goals uh, of our research group and talk about how CODEX is well-suited to help answer the questions that we're asking. Um, then I'll get into our experience with custom antibody conjugation and building a tissue-specific panel for studying the human pancreas. Two disclosures. Um, one, while we are experienced with immunohistochemistry in general, um, this is our first time using a multiplex system. Um, and second, we've had the codex system for only about three or four months, so the data that I'll be showing you today is relatively preliminary. So in the Powers and Bursova Research Group, um, we're particularly interested in understanding cellular niches during pancreatic development and also in the context of disease pathophysiology. Uh, the pancreatic islet microenvironment is composed of a lot of diverse cell types. Um, so if you think about the pancreas as an organ, um, it sits below the liver in the body cavity, and um, it's really a bifunctional organ, so um, composed of two compartments, exocrine and endocrine. The exocrine compartment uh, makes up about 98% of the mass, um, and it consists of acinar cells that secrete digestive enzymes um, into a branch ductal network that empties into the duodenum. And then scattered throughout those, um, or throughout that exocrine tissue, are um, islets of Langerhans or islets, which are small clusters of cells um, that are composed of um, endocrine cells that secrete hormones to regulate blood glucose. 
And islet stem cells are really these kind of mini organs um, that are made up of alpha and delta cells, alpha, delta, and beta cells, sorry. Um, and these are um, endocrine cells that secrete hormones um, that help regulate your blood glucose. But it's also important to remember um, what we consider the islet microenvironment or other cell types that come into close contact with the endocrine cells. Um, so those include nerves, um, as well as blood vessels, which are structurally composed of endothelial cells, um, and also act as a conduit for immune cells, such as macrophages, to enter the tissue. Our lab is primarily focused on studying human tissue, and so we have developed um, a robust infrastructure in order to be able to um, answer some of these important questions about human biology. Um, and so the way that this is set up is that we work with um, a, a number of different organ procurement organizations around the country. Um, and when a organ becomes available for research, um, we communicate within our team and then actually ship that organ directly to our collaborator in Pittsburgh. And there, um, she's able to isolate those islets or small clusters of functional cells um, and also take uh, serial sections of the tissue. So in that way, um, we can study both the function of islets um, as well as the overall tissue morphology from the same organ. And at that point, um, tissue and islets get shipped to Vanderbilt as well as our collaborators um, around the country. So this processing of the pancreas, as I mentioned, is, is what we've developed to be able to answer complex questions about both function and um, to overall tissue architecture. So the primary um, way that we uh, are able to do this is by um, taking serial sections of the tissue and processing it for different imaging modalities and other types of experiments. So for example, um, we have a protocol that allows us to fix tissue for electron microscopy. Um, we also save some as fresh frozen tissue. Um, as well as formalin fixed paraffin embedded, um, and then finally a lightly fixed um, OCT embedded, which I'll speak to a little bit more later. And then from um, the, the regions directly adjacent to these, um, we're able then to isolate islets, and these are used to perform functional um, and meta metabolic studies, as well as um, perform some um, immune studies, particularly in healthy um, pancreata and those uh, affected by type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So what I'll be focusing on in this presentation um, and showing you in some of these codex images are um, these lightly fixed tissues. And um, this was a protocol that was developed by Dr. Marcella Brasova, uh, who recognized that the um, traditional ways of processing tissues were not adequate for um, the types of tissue morphology analysis that we were trying to do. Um, so what she developed was um, a, a protocol in which the tissues are lightly fixed in a 4% paraformaldehyde solution. Um, and then washed and equilibrated in a sucrose gradient. Um, and this really, we found, um, is able to preserve the tissue architecture in a way that um, the flash frozen or formalin fixed um, tissues were not, um, were not quite up to speed. As I mentioned, um, one area of interest for our research team is understanding how endocrine cells interact and communicate during postnatal pancreas development. So here I'll be showing you um, a couple of traditional immunohistochemical images um, where DAPI is shown in blue and endocrine cells are shown in green, red, and white. So um, you can see that just after birth, endocrine cells are quite dense with a lot of individual cells and just small clusters um, around the periphery here of the tissue. And then as the pancreas grows rapidly along with the whole body, um, these small clusters of cells gradually coalesce into larger islets um, and overall, you can see in this last image under the childhood category, um, the islets are becoming less densely distributed. Um, and this is occurring because the acinar tissue is expanding at a much more rapid pace. And so there are fewer islets shown here in kind of the same, the same size of image frame. And if you look at the, um, kind of zoom into the islets themselves, um, you'll see that the overall architecture changes during this first decade of life as well. Um, so in the early period after birth and during um, neonatal and infancy stages, um, you see a real core mantle structure with beta cells um, in, shown in green there in the middle of the islet structure, and then alpha and delta cells um, kind of surrounding in the periphery. But by childhood, um, as you can see by this last image, the alpha, beta, and delta cells are really fully intermingled, and this is reminiscent of what an adult um, islet looks like. So um, overall, during this first decade of life, um, we're seeing drastic changes in islet density as well as rearrangement of endocrine cells. 
um, and adult, adult beta cells really have a very low proliferative capacity. And so it's thought that um, these, these early processes of um, both endocrine cell expansion and rearrangement may affect um, the future susceptibility of an individual to diabetes. And so it's particularly important that we study this time period. Um, and it's also the, the case that it's during these first few years of life that um, autoimmunity, which is an important component of type 1 diabetes, is first observed. So for those two reasons, um, we're very interested in, in understanding more about the cellular events that are occurring. So one active area of research in our lab um, is looking at the um, the context of type 1 diabetes, which is um, has an autoimmune component. So here I'm just showing an image of an islet that's outlined in a, a, a red color um, along with immune cells, CD45 positive, that are shown in brown. Um, and so you can see by this image and the one below that there are a great deal of um, immune cells that are um, localized around the islet at the onset of type 1 diabetes. So we're interested in asking questions like which other cell types are involved in this um, immune infiltration as well as the signaling molecules that are involved, so what types of cytokines or receptors are um, maybe mediating these events. And then we're also interested in understanding how endocrine cells interact with, um, with immune cells in a, in a regular environment. So I'm showing here an image of a marker um, called NTPDase3, which modulates extracellular ATP concentrations. And it has an interesting phenotype such that it's expressed in aspenor tissue um, right after birth. Um, but by about one or two years of age, it becomes um, specifically in expressed actually in beta cells. So we are wondering if this um, switch in phenotype may have implications for the pro-inflammatory, ATP-rich environment and, and how these cells might respond to that. Um, so again, we're interested in those cellular interactions um, as well as kind of generally how the islet microenvironment influences development. So I think it's clear how um, the, the types of biological questions that we're asking in our laboratory um, are really well suited for um, the codex system. So one of the first things that we did when we first um, purchased the system was to start thinking about the antibody panel that we would be building and how we would be conjugating our own custom antibodies. So this is a straightforward labeling protocol um, that takes only about four hours. It can be done on a bench top. Um, and I just want to emphasize here that um, it was really helpful for us to go over the um, pre-conjugated -co pre list of, of codex antibodies that are available from Akoya, um, because that really then determines how you choose the specific barcodes that are um, most appropriate for the custom conjugation. And just to give you an idea of what this process is like, um, it first comes with, it comes with all of the reagents in the kit, but um, first it's just a step of um, concentrating and priming um, the antibody and then annealing to those oligo barcodes that are, um, that are produced by Akoya and, and shipped to you. So um, after that a reaction occurs, you'll then just go through a few steps to purify um, the conjugated antibody and then run a, a, a protein gel just to verify that conjugation occurred. So here I'm showing a simple protein gel, and if you zoom in on these two lanes here that I've highlighted, um, the band on the left there represents um, a loaded antibody that is unconjugated, so you can see the, the um, weight of that antibody determines where it, where it flows in the gel. And then on the right here, you can see that, that um, the, the molecular weight of that sample has now shifted um, due to the addition of the oligo barcode. Um, so this type of um, QC just verifies that, in, in fact, the chemistry um, was successful and that the barcode is now attached to the antibody. And um, I've done this now for 11 different antibodies, um, and in my hands have had um, success with um, successfully using them in a panel in eight of those instances. Um, and I'll just note here that um, all of the antibodies that I've, or almost all of the antibodies that I've attempted to um, label have been monoclonal and they've all been free of carrier proteins, which is a requirement for the labeling procedure. And once you've verified that the, um, the, the barcodes have in fact conjugated to your antibody, the next step is to um, perform a, a staining validation, which actually just happens on your bench top again, not, not with the machine. Um, and that's really the step where you get to assess um, how successful deconjugation really was. So for that procedure, um, the goal is really then to allow the user to um, specifically titrate the antibody as well as validate it in the tissue of interest that will be used ultimately um, in the codex machine. 
So um, this procedure is done in um, six well plates, just like a regular codex experiment. So you're actually using the cover slips that you've prepared um, that Dr. Carlson mentioned before. And um, then you're just subjecting them to um, the regular codex um, antibody incubation procedure. So um, in this case, you're incubating with the primary antibodies or the, the primary antibodies that have those um, unique oligos. And then you'll add the codex reporters in a step that kind of simulates what happens in the codex machine during an experiment. But in this case, it'll be done on your bench top. So in most cases, um, the recommendation is that um, you use a conjugate, the, the newly conjugated antibody that you've just conjugated, and then you also um, use a conjugated antibody that has already been validated. So maybe a marker that stains the same type of cell that you're looking at and a marker that stains the different to account for kind of a positive and negative control. Um, and then once you've done that, um, you'll mount your cover slip and, and actually visualize that stain to see and assess um, uh, how your an conjugated antibody has performed. Now we ran, ran into a little bit of trouble first thing because um, since we're working in pancreatic tissue, a lot of the antigens that we're interested in um, recognizing are not previously validated codex antibodies. And so we knew we were gonna have to figure out how to modify this procedure in order to um, run positive and negative controls with antibodies that were not previously validated. And so um, what we came up with was um, in addition to staining with our newly conjugated antibody, we also added an unlabeled antibody um, to that incubation step. And then bef um, before we um, incubated with those codex reporters, we actually added a traditional secondary antibody um, and incubated just in the storage buffer that's provided with the, with the staining kit from Akoya. Um, and this allowed us to successfully um, visualize both traditional antibody and codex antibody on the same slide. So that was really key in helping us to um, feel confident that our um, newly conjugated antibodies were staining the correct cells. And this slide just um, is a list of the uh, markers that we've been using in our tissue samples. Um, and I'll be showing you some images here in the next few slides, but I wanted to give you a sense of the um, pre-conjugated and validated um, uh, antibodies that come from Akoya. Those are shown highlighted in blue. Um, and then also the antigens that we've prepared as custom conjugated antibodies. Um, and you can see that they represent a mix of different cell types um, and also obviously have a, a range of different um, uh, corresponding reporters so that we can um, efficiently use um, multiple fluorophores in each cycle during our codex run. And our system here at Vanderbilt is, um, is integrated with the Kiant scope, um, the, the BCX800. Um, the images I'll show you here are um, using an APO 20X lens, and um, the filter cubes that we are using are um, the DAPI GSP TRIT-C, which is recognizing the 550 wavelength, and then um, the side 5 so this image here is um, a representative um, of one of our tissue sections that we're interested in, in learning more about. Um, this, this sample actually comes from a um, donor that um, died very soon after birth. Um, so this is really the, the uh, kind of mid-development of a pancreas. And um, I mentioned before this, this tissue was fixed um, lightly in PSA prior to embedding and, and freezing in, uh, in OCT media. Um, and then the, the kind of experimental outline of this image um, is, is listed in the top right-hand corner, but we were using eight codex cycles, which were six of which um, had antibodies involved. The other two were just the DAPI for um, registration purposes. Um, and then I, we used these 18 antibodies that I showed you a couple slides back. And um, this particular image came from um, about nine by nine tiles at 20X. So, um, we took nine Z-planes and then the codex software during the processing um, selected the best, uh, best focus plane. And you can see in the um, bottom left-hand corner, um, I'm showing you different cell types that are highlighted in this particular panel. Um, so although we used 18 antibodies, only seven are shown in this particular image, um, just for purposes of, of color and visualizing. Um, and so you can see that um, very quickly that the um, compartments of the pancreas that I showed you in those initial images in the introduction um, are very easily visualized by these codex antibodies, um, particularly the blood vessels shown in red, as well as the endocrine cells or islet clusters that are shown in that yellow, green, and blue color. 
And then here is just zooming in a little bit more um, so you can start to get a sense of the resolution um, from these images. Um, and again, we've used a mixture of both um, the pre-validated, pre-conjugated Akoya antibodies with our antibodies, um, and, and that's really enabled us to highlight uh, multiple different compartments of this tissue. And I wanted to give you a sense also of um, the range of antibodies. So um, this is all the same image, the same um, experiment, but just um, kind of broken down into different markers visualized. So the top left-hand corner shows the individual um, types of endocrine cells that we're able to, um, to, to look at, depending on which, which antibody combination. Um, the top right shows some of the vascular structure, um, as well as um, some of immune cells. Um, that are highlighted by CD4 and CD89. Um, the bottom left hand is the um, image, similar to the image I showed in the previous slide, um, particularly highlighting the um, epithelium shown with the cytokeratin. And um, you can see some little um, uh, magenta dots indicating proliferating cells um, through KI67. And then the, the bottom right hand panel again is um, starting to um, really phenotypes the particular immune cells that we see around islets in the developing pancreas. So um, you can see we've used a combination of markers that recognize macrophages and other, um, other cell types um, to start to um, be able to phenotype these cells further. And then I wanted to give you a quick preview of um, the reason that we've chosen to use the slightly fixed tissue. Um, so we're, you'll, you'll see here these two different tissues. Unfortunately, they're not from donors of the exact same age, but kind of a similar um, developmental stage. So on the left is, is just a fresh frozen tissue, which is one of the recommended um, uh, starting points for, for the codex system. And then on the right will be the lightly fixed tissue that we've um, kind of developed in our laboratory. So in this first, um, this first row shows some of the Akoya preconjugated antibodies, and as you can tell um, from the images, they perform quite well in both the fresh frozen and the lightly fixed tissue. Um, so you can see that this resolution is, um, is very good, um, isolating both individual cells as well as structures. Um, but then when you start to look at the islet cells in particular, which we find are the most sensitive to um, fixation procedures, um, you can really appreciate, I hope, from these images that um, using the lightly fix, light, light fixation protocol really um, helps us to preserve the integrity of the cell um, to the cellular shape and also to um, ensure that the antibodies are, are recognizing the antigens that, um, that they're designed to. So I just wanted to give you kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of our experience um, using those antibodies in this um, slightly different type of tissue. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, we've only had this system for um, a couple of months, so we actually haven't had the opportunity to do a lot of the really exciting analysis yet. Um, however, I did want to give you an example of the types of tools that um, can be applied to images using the built-in multiplex analysis viewer or MAV. So this is an image similar to the ones um, I've shown previously, and um, once these images have been acquired, um, what I've actually been able to do is to use um, the, uh, the software in the MAV to isolate and kind of um, uh, annotate the different cellular uh, or cell, cell subpopulations within the pancreas. So you can see in this little box in the right-hand corner um, a plot of um, individual cells within the image that are and their expression levels of two of the markers that we're interested in. So on the x-axis is chromogranin A, which marks all endocrine cells, and then C-peptide, which marks beta cells, is on the y-axis. And so I've drawn here um, a gate similar to the way you would draw a gate um, using a flow cytometer um, in order to specify which cells are positive for both of these markers, and then I, I can then assign those to a specific population. Now you can also have the um, software do this automatically without any kind of user-directed input, but since um, these tissues are a little bit challenging to segment sometimes, um, we chose to do this kind of directed approach, at least for now. So once I've chosen this gate, I can essentially um, then apply the um, algorithms within the software to um, go through my entire image and annotate which cell types um, are, are located at each XY point. So um, here, the purple dots that you see are identifying non-endocrine cells, and then the yellow, blue, and pink dots are, are actually um, identifying the three of the specific endocrine cell types that we're interested in analyzing further. 
And then um, this is a Veroni plot, actually just an overlay here of the image, but you really get the sense of how um, intricate and how um, at what high resolution we're going to be able to um, map these specific cell types. And so some of the things that we're going to do in the future will involve applying the um, multi-marker analysis tools that, that Dr. Carlson mentioned before um, in order to answer some of the questions that we are asking about um, the interactions between cell types and the pancreas. So just in conclusion, um, I wanted to uh, let everyone know that we were able to um, successfully integrate our um, Kiant uh, microscope to be able to integrate with the um, codex software and perform image acquisition. And that also um, our experience with um, easily being able to custom conjugate our antibodies um, really allowed us to um, personalize an antibody panel that could highlight multiple pancreatic compartments. And then um, we did find that the codex antibodies that were designed for this fresh frozen tissue um, can actually detect antigen successfully in our lightly fixed tissue. And then as I alluded to, um, we're definitely going to be using and applying the multi-marker spatial analysis tools in MAV um, to help us determine where um, endocrine cells are interacting with immune cells, particularly we're interested in macrophages. And then we also want to expand and adapt our panel to um, apply to other developmental cohorts um, as well as type 2 diabetes um, to be able to kind of get a deep phenotyping of um, the different cells that are, are present in the microenvironment. Um, I just wanted to thank a couple members of my lab, particularly Nathaniel Hart, um, who did a lot of um, the initial characterization of the, um, the human pancreas development after birth. Um, and also our collaborators at Stanford, um, Sung Kim and Yan Heng, um, who have been a uh, great help to us in helping to identify antibodies that are good candidates for conjugation and um, kind of getting us, helping getting us up and running. Um, so I think with that, um, we are going to transition to our Q&A. Okay, thank you, Dr. Saunders and Dr. Carlson, for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Dr. Carlson, let's kick off with this question. Have you seen any steric hindrance between antibodies with panels of a larger size? For example, 25 to 30 markers. So that's a good question, and this is something that we have tested. And we have not observed steric hindrance for uh, large antibody panels. And we also have a white paper, actually, uh, for download on our website detailing how we validate our antibodies, which addresses this question. Thank you. And, you know, I'm going to stick with you. Dr. Carlson, you just showed a list of mouse and human antibodies compatible with Codex. Is this the same list of antibodies that are commercially available and most up to date? And is there a shareable list of community antibodies? So uh, there is in that list included a subset of antibodies that are available as validated antibodies uh, from Okoya. And we know that those lists of antibodies work with Codex. Um, I'm happy to share uh, any antibody list with customers uh, offline. Very good. Thank you. Let's go to our next question. How does this platform deal with and overcome autofluorescence? So there's, there's two ways in which we overcome autofluorescence. Uh, one way is through background subtraction. So in using the codex, we have the ability to hybridize and dehybridize codex reporters. What that enables us to do is run blank cycles, which we have uh, no codex reporters in that blank cycle, only DAPI. That gives us a baseline background, which we can subtract uh, as non-signal um, to go forward and remove autofluorescence. We also have the ability for FFPE tissue to use the size 7 channel instead of the 50 channel to navigate away from that high autofluorescence. Thank you. Now, can the output of the codex processor be a multi-layer TIFF? 
Christy, this is Diane. I can answer that. Um, so we've actually been able to process our images in a way that um, the, the, pro the codex processor itself will um, stitch together an image depending on the, the type of scope you use. And um, when you open that image in the, in the image J suite, um, you're then able to manipulate it just like you really can with any um, image in image J. And so um, you can export it as um, o an OME TIFF, or um, if you have another file format that you prefer, um, you can do those manipulations and, um, and export those directly from the, um, the image J with the, using the MAV. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Can the images be exported and could they be used in other software platforms for analysis like ImageJ or similar? So I can take this question, and the answer is simply yes. They're just TIFF images that are produced. Um, so you can go ahead and use them uh, with any third-party or alternative image analysis software that you'd like to use. We have some great questions coming in. Uh, let's see, what fluorescent channels are available, and will this be increased? Right, so that's another good question that I can help address. So the fluorescence channels that we're going to be using are the, uh, the DAPI, the 488, the ADO 550, the Sci-5, and for FFPE, uh, the Alexa Floor 750 channels. And I don't have any information about whether or not that will be increased at this time. Next question, is the empirical success judged by the gel electrophore Oh, excuse me, electrophoresis result, actual tissue staining, or both? So the um, answer to that is both. Uh, the number I showed there, the 8 out of 11, um, those were um, antibodies that have been successfully used in our panel. So um, I think actually 10 out of the 11 were successfully conjugated based on the protein gel, and then um, two of them, for whatever reason, did not, um, did not retain their, their signal um, within the tissue afterwards. But um, yeah, we definitely go through the whole process before calling it a success. Next question is your, in your antibody development, did you test how long the antibody would last? In other words, how many cycles could you go without losing signal? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I can, absolutely. In your antibody development, did you test how long the antibody would last? In other words, how many cycles could you go without losing signal? Sure, so that's a great question, and I, I can speak to that. So we've gone for, internally we've tested 16 cycles without seeing a loss of antigen detection. And I think um, a paper was recently published using Codex uh, where they tested 33 cycles and saw no loss of uh, detection of the target antigen. So I can say very confidently that we do not see a loss of signal from, or loss of signal and the ability to detect that target antigen. Thank you. Now, I just want to quickly remind our audience, we have so many great questions coming in. Those questions that we are unable to answer today due to time restraints and those that come in during the on-demand period, they will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Okay, let's jump to our next question. When titrating the antibody, did you formally calculate a signal, noise, or was this more qualitative? So for, for the antibodies that we conjugated ourselves, um, it was a more of a qualitative analysis. Um, and I'm not sure if, if Dr. Carlton can speak about the um, recommended titrations for the Okoya antibodies. Sure. So we, we titrate the majority of our antibodies in our control tissues uh, for our validated antibodies. There are some subsets of tissues that we titrate specifically for those tissues of interest. And, and I'm happy to have a dialogue on, on how we do that separately after the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Carlson and Dr. Saunders. Now our next question. Um, Dr. Carlson, this one's for you. Um, how do you deal with autofluorescence in FFPE tissue? Great. So um, I think we, we might have touched on that a little bit earlier, but just to reiterate, we have two modalities to deal with this. There is the ability to do background uh, subtraction, running a blank cycle, and then also using Alexafluor uh, 750 instead of the 50 channel. Dr. Saunders, let's come over to you. Were the antibodies that you used for custom codex conjugation already verified through IHC previously? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So um, definitely all of the antibodies that we attempted conjugation with were antibodies that we had already screened. So um, we just did that on regular slides using traditional immunohistochemistry. Um, and then once we were confident that um, they were working well in those tissues, um, then, we were, then we would move over to the conjugation process. Thanks, Dr. Saunders. Uh, Dr. Carlson, is Codex compatible with TMAU scores? Cores, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So yes, it is compatible with TMA cores, just like the rest of the tissues. You just need to section that uh, TMA onto a cover slip. Very good. Now, let's stick with you. What antigen retrieval is recommended for FFPE samples? Yeah, that's a question we get uh, quite commonly. And so this antigen retrieval is actually a lot like traditional antigen retrieval. There's some heat involved and then either citrate and or EDTA. And the clones you're using uh, to stain your tissue actually determine uh, whether you're going to use citrate and or uh, the TRIS EDTA buffer. Thank you. Dr. Carlson, let's stick with you real quick. Can Codex data be analyzed by third-party pipelines or software packages? Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, Dr. Saunders, let's jump over to you. How long does it take from tissue preparation and staining to downstream data analysis for the 18 marker panel? Yeah, so um, that's really going to depend on a couple different variables. Um, the, the actual bed shop staining itself doesn't take very long. So, um, well, it, I mean, it's comparable to regular immunohistochemistry. So um, it probably takes, including the antibody incubation, excuse me, um, about five hours um, of prep time. And then once you get on the actual codex machine, um, you know, it depends on how large your imaging region is really is the, is the major factor there. So um, I think in the images that I showed in this presentation, I would say the average time for the experiment on the instrument was um, roughly eight hours, um, eight or nine. And then you're looking at another couple hours um, of processing, which of course can be running on a different computer while, you know, while your codex machine is still doing something else. Um, and we really haven't done a large uh, majority of of analysis yet, so I can't really speak to that. I think it kind of depends on how granular you want to get. But um, yeah, I would say from start to finish, um, probably you're looking at at least 12 to 15 hours of kind of getting the, the data out. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Now, let's stick with you. How do you store all the data generated from each run? And as you scale up Codex experiments, how do you plan to address data storage? Yeah, this is a, kind of a, a source of concern for us just um, because we are planning to um, screen a large volume of tissues. So um, we have some network-associated storage um, available at our um, institution that we're taking advantage of as well as some, um, uh, some cloud-based um, backup and, and some other servers available. So um, I think it definitely is um, a situation where you, you want to have a conversation with the IT department or um, the infrastructure within your institution um, or company to make sure that um, you have kind of the, the bandwidth to be able to store these large image files sometimes, you know, up to a gigabyte for just a single experiment. So um, I think in the same way that, you know, sequencing data requires a lot of, um, of storage space and of um, kind of uh, forethought and planning um, when you implement a new system, you, you just kind of have to be ready for that um, influx of data. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Now, here's a question. How large are these images and what kind of IT support is necessary? Yeah, that's great. So um, I'll take that question. So the, the size of the uh, image is going to be dependent on really the size of the tissue. So it's hard to give a, a firm number for that. But we're on the scale of like gigabytes of data here, not megabytes. And in terms of the uh, IT support, uh, we help you with the installation and setup of everything. You know, whether you want to set up some servers or um, ha have an alternative setup beyond what our standard installation is, that's that's totally up to you. We're flexible, and um, you know, it, it really depends on what you want to do. Thank you. Can I use Flow software to analyze output data? Yeah, that's that's also a good question. So the two types of files that are produced by um, the codex are the FCS files and the TIFF images. And so flow data or the flow software is going to be able to process those FCS files. So yes. Okay. Thank you. And this is for Dr. Saunders. 
What was your evaluation of the efficiency of Codex's cell segmentation pipeline? Did you try an alternative method such as cell profiler? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and for those of you who don't uh, study the pancreas, um, it's kind of a difficult organ to work with in some cases. So um, cell segmentation is a little bit more challenging than, than some other tissues. So we, um, we didn't evaluate really another um, pathway side by side. We um, typically in our lab use Indica software um, to, uh, to do our analysis, um, our, our algorithm-assisted analysis. So, um, you know, comparing it to the, the Indica Labs um, software that I've used, I would say that it's um, just as good, if not better. Um, but I haven't, I haven't gone through in a detailed fashion and compared it to other systems. Thank you. What was what is the optimal tissue thickness for codex analysis? So I can speak a little bit to this. So uh, the tissue has to be between five and ten microns thick. So it needs to be uh, somewhere in that range. And I think the the tissue, all of the tissues that I showed you were between eight and ten microns. So. Um, you know, depending on how large your the section that you're trying to image is, or sorry, how how um, large the area is that you're trying to image, um, you will sometimes need to adjust um, the you know the the range of Z stack. So um, when, like I mentioned, the the processor during the analysis or sorry pre analysis during the processing phase um, will select the best plane essentially for each tile. Um, and so the um, thickness of your section there might mean you have to take more or less Z tiles in order to get that best um, focal plane. Thank you. Now, can you do multipoint imaging of just isolates and exclude exocrine tissue? So I think this, this may be a question about um, uh, like regions of interest, um, and that is Grady may be able to answer this a little bit better than me, but um, you can set multiple um, areas of analysis during different um, or during the same imaging run. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily have to take that full section image like the one I showed. You could choose individual locations within it to image. Yeah, I think you've captured that well. You could choose to image those regions or just do the analysis on those regions afterward, whichever way you want to manage manage the data. Thank you. Can you do multipoint? Im um, oops, so sorry. Um, I was reading the same one. Um, we have time for one final question, and let's wrap with this one. And Dr. Saunders, I believe this one's for you. Do you see the need to go up to a 40x objective in the future? Yeah, that's a, um, an interesting uh, thing to think about for us. I, we've, we've traditionally stuck at 20x and feel that that's um, an adequate um, kind of compromise between really being able to capture the um, multicellular nature of the islets, but also to be able to really um, easily capture the uh, you know kind of spatial organization of the the cross sections of the tissue that we're interested in. So um, I would say that the majority of our work is kind of looking at cellular interactions and not so much at at focusing in on individual cells. So um, we don't have any plans in the near future to go up to 40X, but I think certainly it would be, um, you know, it would produce beautiful images. So maybe um, maybe someday we would consider that. Okay, you know what, we're gonna fit in one quick question. And Dr. Saunders, this is for you. When validating custom antibodies in the pancreas with a primary secondary approach, did you use a clone targeting a different epitope? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so in most cases, I actually used a completely different antigen, but an antigen that stained for the same cell, um, if that makes sense. So um, you definitely could use the same um, an antibody that was targeting a different epitope of the same um, antigen, but in, in our case, we actually just completely switched, but in a population that we still knew should, should um, be positive for the same markers. Thank you. Now, I want to thank... Dr. Saunders and Dr. Carlson for their time today and for their important research. And we've had an excellent Q&A session. And I'd like to also extend that thanks out to our audience for joining us and for their interesting questions. Again, questions we did not have time for today. There were some that came in we don't have time to answer. And those that are submitted during our on-demand period will be addressed by Dr. Saunders and Dr. Carlson via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Now, before we go, we'd like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Akoya Biosciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast.
Now a poll will pop up on your screen and your, your participation is greatly appreciated. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.